By pure serendipity, I recently came up with an interesting little trick to enhance the appearance of stars. And once you have your star plate, it's very simple. Now, to execute this trick, you're going to require a layer-based non-destructive photo editor of some kind. I use Affinity Photo. I think you'll be able to do this in Photoshop or GIMP because they're also layer-based non-destructive photo editors and they have a variety of composite modes because that's the next thing that you're going to need are composite modes. And in particular, your photo editor, whatever it may be, is going to require the color dodge and screen composite modes. Now, I am preparing some LRGB information here to apply this trick to it. This is LRGB information resulting from three full nights of shooting the Crescent Nebula, a project that I finished only two nights ago from the time of making this video. You can also do this trick with information from an OSC camera, one shot color camera. I just have a mono camera mounted on the SCT in the observatory, so I'm using mono data right now. Now the first thing to do is prepare the information to get the best possible star plate. Here I am preparing the LRGB channels by getting them ready to run Blur Exterminator on them. I'll run Blur Exterminator first in the correct mode and then the default mode. The correct mode will improve any possible errors in the stars that might happen from say the wind buffeting about the telescope by night and the default mode will properly deconvolve the stars, as well as sharpen up the structure of the Crescent Nebula within the stars. You would do the same thing if you were working with information from a one-shot color camera. Of course, you just wouldn't have to work with the individual luminance and LRGB channels. This next step will be unnecessary for persons using a one-shot color camera. For those using a mono camera, if you're using PixInsight, you then need to align your LRGB channels and of course, you would do the same if you were using narrowband information. You need to align all those channels. So I'm running star alignment, it's very simple. I just drag the luminance channel up to the reference image part and then drag the tabs from the RGB channels to where it says target images, get the original RGB channels out of the way and then hit execute. And in a moment, I'll get three new RGB channels with the suffix registered. And those are aligned and ready for combination after a couple other steps. Now lately, I use linear fit a lot more than spectrophotometric color calibration or SPCC to color calibrate the various channels. Honestly, I'm not terribly impressed with SPCC. Its colors frequently look washed out and muddy, and I get sick of reds looking like salmon pinks that are extremely difficult to correct. I find linear fit gives colors that are intense and more pleasing to the eye. Whether or not they're 100% accurate, maybe they aren't, but the linear fit colors tend to look a lot better. The RGB image with the highest median will become the Linear Fit Tool's reference image. The Statistics Tool revealed that the green channel had the highest median, so it becomes the reference image in Linear Fit. Then I'll drag the Linear Fit process icon over the red and blue channels, and Linear Fit will balance their color intensity against green. The channels are then combined using the Channel Combination Tool, and the Screen Transfer function reveals the outcome. Look at the nice and intense colors in there. Perfect, not to extract those colorful stars. First, I'm going to clone the Linear Fit RGB image, and the linear fit RGB clone will only be used to extract the stars, then we'll discard it. So I have my clone made, and now I'll drag the original image off to the upper right on the inside of the column, because that's where I keep my to-do pile. And then let's get the clone out of the way so that there is room for the screen transfer function and histogram tool. Now the screen transfer function and histogram tools are open. I've clicked on the linear fit RGB clone, and the screen transfer function tool will show the stretch that it's worked on it. I'll drag its process icon onto the histogram tools process icon till I see an hourglass icon and then release the mouse button and the histogram tool will take on the screen transfer functions histogram stretch. Then I'll drag the histogram tools process icon over to the linear fit RGB clone image and that fixes the histogram stretch into the image. The image will turn white because now it has the histogram stretch on top of the screen transfer functions temporary stretch. So I'll reset the screen transfer functions histogram stretch by hitting Ctrl F12. You can also reset the STF stretch by hitting the icon up here to the right. The reason to do this is the screen transfer function does a great job stretching the stars, and it's those STF stretch stars we're going to want. But now that the histogram stretch is done, the next thing to do is run the noise exterminator. Noise exterminator runs best on nonlinear information. On linear information, it often leaves artifacts. And I find it's best to run noise exterminator right after the stretch because otherwise one would just be editing noise with the information. So this gives the best results. I may also use the noise exterminator later on, but I will always use it after the initial histogram stretch. And now, finally, I'm going to run the star exterminator. I'm going to use the most powerful version of the AI, 
and make sure Generate Star Map, Large Overlap, and Unscreen Stars are all selected. Unscreen Stars tells the Star Exterminator that it's working with nonlinear data, so it does a better star removal with nonlinear data. And the Large Overlap tells the Star Exterminator to just look at larger areas while it's removing stars, and I find it just does a consistently better job. Removing stars, it leaves less blotches, less artifacts, and does less damage to any nebulae that may be behind the stars. It takes some more computing power, it takes a little bit longer, but it's absolutely worth it. I run it every single time these days. And of course, you need to run Generate Star Image, otherwise the Star Exterminator will just remove the stars, but not give you a star plate to work with later. What this will do when the Star Exterminator is done is give us a beautiful plate of colorful stars. They're not oversaturated or over bright. We're just getting the RGB stars and the noise has even been removed from them. It's going to be a superb plate to work with later on in the developing process. There's our star plate. So I'm going to save that as a lossless TIFF to reapply to the image later. It's actually a pretty good stretch of the Crescent Nebula right there, but I'm not going to work with it. I'm going to go ahead and stick that in my garbage pile. And then I'm going to open that non-linear original version of the linear fit RGB image and remove the stars from it and then go ahead and edit that image. Now you're probably wondering why I did things this way. It's a longer way to go about things. The reason has to do with playing to the advantages of each tool. Star Exterminator in particular does the best job removing the stars while the data is still linear. That is to say, before the histogram has been stretched on the original image. However, to get the cleanest stars, I also wanted to denoise the image. And to properly denoise the image, I have to stretch the information. This means that for the best non-stellar structure, I need to remove the stars while the information is linear, but for the best stars, I have to remove the stars while the information is non-linear. To work around this limitation, I made a clone of the linear fit RGB information. Then I did a histogram stretch on the clone so that I could then run the noise exterminator, and then run the star exterminator to get my noise-free star plate. Then I could go back to the original image, the linear fit RGB image that had not yet had the histogram stretch applied, and use the star exterminator in linear mode on it to remove the stars, and thereby get the best information of the non-stellar structure for editing. So when all those operations were done, I then prepared the luminance channel in the same way. I'll clone it, stretch the clone, run the noise exterminator on the clone, and then the star exterminator, and then I'll save that star plate. Now, I probably will not need that luminance star plate, but it's handy to have it. Sometimes there's information there that we may want to use later, so I always save it just as a precaution. I can always delete that, that file later on. So I save the star plate derived from the luminance clone, and then discard the clone. And on the original linear luminance channel, I'll remove the stars, do a histogram stretch, denoise the image, and then save the image for editing outside of PixInsight. Now we've done the preparation. Let's go ahead and pop over to Affinity Photo and combine those stars back. This is where it gets fun, because in this method, we've derived the best possible stars. And in Affinity Photo, we're going to recombine them in a way that really makes them glow. It, it makes them just brilliant. And I discovered this method just by accident, just a mouse slip, and I thought, wow. So anyway, let's pop over to Affinity Photo. So I'm in Affinity Photo, and I've completed the editing of the nebula structure, the Crescent Nebula. Now I'm going to open the File Explorer and drag in the star plate. I'm just going to use the RGB star plate. I don't think that I'll need the luminance star plate that I saved. So in Affinity Photo, I can drag in that star plate. It becomes a new layer. I can drag the layer into place. At the moment, snapping is turned on, so the star plate locks into place exactly where it should be over the rest of the nebula. Now we're going to apply the power of compositing. Compositing is one of the most powerful photo editing tools at your disposal. It allows you to blend the qualities of images in selective and very interesting ways. Normally, what I would do with a star plate is I would choose the screen composite mode right here. And then I would use a curves tool to drag down the luminosity of the stars so that they don't overwhelm the nebula structure. Nebulae and other non-stellar structures tend to be subtle compared to stars, and an abundance of stars has a way of drowning them out, even if the non-stellar structure is bright, as we see here. But what happens is using the curves tool to reduce the stars makes them just dull. They're, they're there, they're nice, but they're just dull. So about two weeks ago, I was editing an image and had reached the point where it was time to drag the star plate over the image. I opened the composite list to select the screen mode and mouse slipped onto the color dodge mode and froze at the sight of the gleaming beautiful stars that appeared. Color dodge had brought the stars into the image in a way that was, there's no other word for it other than radiant. 
The stars were there, but they were not so bright as to risk overwhelming the delicate crescent nebula. And they glowed like stars should. Let's take a look. I'm going to go ahead and open up the composite mode drop down menu and select color dodge. Take a close look at the difference. Using the color dodge mode to composite the stars onto the image restrains the stars that are dimmer so that they do not overwhelm the image, while the stars of mid brightness and brighter, they glow, they radiate. They don't just look like bright points on an image, they actually look like starlight on an image now. They look to me like real stars. Screen compositing the stars and then using the curves tool to dim them left the stars flat, but these stars are vibrant and full of life. But Color Dodge also reveals fewer stars. Now there is a vast field of stars around the Crescent Nebula, and we can add them into the image while restraining them so that the nebula still predominates the image. To do this, I'll begin by duplicating the star plate. Keep the duplicate star plate above the Color Dodge star plate. Then I'll select the Screen Composite mode. What the Screen Composite mode does is just add any light in that layer to whatever is below. And then I'll use the Opacity slider to drop the opacity of the screen star plate to about 25%. Now the stars of medium brightness and more still have that magical glow that was imparted to them by the Color Dodge Composite mode. And the second star plate, applying 25% of the Screen Composite mode, enlivens the dimmer stars, filling the field with stars, but also restrains them from dominating the image. So, with the two star plates combined, one with color dodge and one with screen composite, we get a vast field of radiant stars that is not overwhelming. Let's see the results with the finished image. I call this method the two plate color dodge screen method because that's pretty much exactly what it is. And I've been using this method to add stars back to images for the past two weeks and I am delighted with the results. I keep comparing it against the old method, which is just the screen composite method, which is the same thing as the pixel math method for adding stars back. And every single time, this, this comes out better. So remember, you get the best stars by extracting them from your RGB information or if you're using a one-shot color camera, just your one-shot information, by creating a clone, stretching the clone, running noise exterminator on it, and then running the star exterminator with large overlap and unscreened stars selected. And then, after you're done editing the image and you're ready to add the stars back, apply the star plate with the color dodge mode. Then duplicate the star plate and switch it to the screen composite mode. Make sure the screen layer is above the color dodge layer and apply the screen layer at anywhere from 10 to 50%, whatever you like best. This is an image I recently completed of the Crescent Nebula and represents three days of gathering information. If you want to see the full res version, you can follow the link provided in the description to the Sky Story Astro Bin. I hope this helps and improves your images and that you are able to use this technique as one more tool for your toolbox and that it helps you to have a blast imaging that beautiful sky right overhead. Now as always, thank you for watching and if you have any observations or thoughts, please leave them in the comments section below. And whatever else you do, always be sure to take the time to get out there and shoot the sky.